Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Uh, We are continuing in our series through the book of Colossians. Today we are on part three. Okay, we're going to be finishing up the very first chapter. Hallelujah. Okay, we're we're making some ground. Okay, we'll be finishing up chapter one. It only took us three weeks. Uh, But if you're here for the first time, or maybe you're visiting, I just want to encourage you guys uh, to check out the videos, the, the sermons online or on our Facebook page, just so that you can kind of keep up with us, uh, track with us as we continue through this study. So they're available for you online in case you uh, missed it. But I want to begin this message with a question, okay, a question. And the question is, can you think of a time that you willingly or you voluntarily went through something difficult? Okay, you, you went through some pain, whether it was physical pain, some emotional pain, maybe some mental pain, but you went through this difficulty willingly because you knew or you expected that the outcome was going to be worth it, that it was going to all be worth it in the end. And so that's why you went through it. Uh, take a moment to think about this, and uh, why don't you actually turn to the person next to you and discuss this. Maybe you can share if you've been through this sort of experience. Okay, so go ahead and you guys can have some discussion, share, yeah, I I went through this time and, and I was expecting this and that's why I went through it. Go ahead and share. I just give you about 10 more seconds, finish up your stories. <laughs> all right, all right. Very good, very good. Seems like a lot of you have something to share. How many of you guys actually have this experience? You could, you could recall something. Nobody? Okay, a couple people. A couple people. Okay, my guess is maybe you had to think about it. Maybe you didn't have enough time to think. But let me give you an example uh, from my own life. Okay, so when I was in the ninth grade, okay, the one thing that I loved the most was basketball. Okay, I was obsessed. I grew up in L.A. I was a huge Laker fan. Okay, I wanted to be the first Korean-American NBA player. All right, and, uh, but then I realized I'm Korean. Okay, I'm not going to grow any taller, <laughs> right? So my dreams were crushed. But I just loved basketball so much, and so I joined the basketball team, okay? So I joined it, and uh, it, was, it was really hard. It was really hard because all we did was we did this physical exercise. They were called suicides. Does anybody know what those are? Okay, yeah, if you grew up in the West, you probably know. But if you don't know what it is, The reason it's called a suicide is because it feels like death. It really does, okay? It's this exercise where really you have this basketball court, and the basketball court has all these lines, and you start at one line, and you have to run to the closest line, touch it, go back to the first line, touch it, go to the next furthest line, touch it, and then go to the next, you know, first line, touch it, and do the whole thing, but you had to do this more than one time. And the catch is that you had to do this in a certain amount of time. Let's say you had only five minutes to do the whole thing. And if the whole team didn't finish it in five minutes, then guess what? You got to do it all over again. And it was, and of course, there was always one guy who just couldn't do it, right? And so pretty much it was just, we were doing this all the time. And so it was painful. It was painful. But I remember my coach, and I still remember his voice. He'll always be saying something like, no pain, no gain, right? He's always yelling this, no pain, no gain. Keep it up. No pain, no gain. Right? And what he's saying is if you want to become a better basketball player, if you want to get fit, you want to get gain in your basketball skills, then you got to go through some pain. Right? And, and that was pretty much what drove me. That was pretty much the reason that I endured. Okay, I didn't quit the basketball team. I just kept doing it because I wanted to gain as a basketball player. I thought it's going to be worth it. And uh, I believe it was. Okay, maybe my friends will <laughs> disagree with me, but I think I became a better basketball player. Um, I was really fit. Like, I, could, I just could run for hours and hours. I never remembered feeling tired when I was younger. Okay, and so I really gained from it, and that's why I went through it. And so maybe for many of us, you know, maybe you couldn't think of a situation, but my guess is that uh, you're probably willing to go through some pain if you see that the result is going to be worth it, right? If you see that, no, it's going to be worth it, so I can endure, I'm going to do this, okay? But now let me ask you another question, okay? 
Would you be willing to go through some difficulty, okay, some pain, if you knew and you expected that the outcome was going to be worth it for someone else? Okay? And some of you guys are like, oh, man, no way, right? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, right? Would you be willing to go through some pain so that someone else might gain, right? Would you be willing to say, I'm willing to go through pain in order that you might gain? Now, this is a tough message. I know, okay? I know. And I want to be the very first to admit and to confess that this is hard, this is not easy. It goes against everything that our selfish nature wants. And so, especially for me as a pastor, you know, standing up here and preaching this, I want to be the first to say that I'm preaching to myself, really, okay? If you guys are listening to this message and you're convicted and you're like, oh man, I got a lot of growing to do, I, I'm so far off, I'm with you, okay? I'm with you, preaching this to myself. But my hope and prayer is that this message challenges us, right? Maybe even in, hopefully inspires us. We're inspired by the Holy Spirit to take a step in the right direction. Maybe even if it's a, just a small step in the direction of being willing to say, you know what? My pain, your gain. I'm willing to go through some pain if you're going to gain. Now our passage comes today from Colossians chapter 1 verses 24 and 29, okay? It's the end of chapter 1. Uh, please turn there with me if you have your Bibles. Uh, if you don't, you can look at your bulletins. It's just right there on the back. But Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. And if you're there, please say, ready. ready. All right. And if you need a moment to get there, please say, wait. All right. I will wait. I will wait. Okay. Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 29. All right, hopefully everyone is there. This is the word of the Lord, okay? Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. To make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Let's pray together. Father, we, we come before you so humbly and uh, we want to thank you so much that you care about us so much. You care about the well-being of our soul so much that you've given us your word to teach us, to correct us, to sharpen us, to instruct us, to encourage us to give us life. And so, Lord, we want to take hold of uh, life today by uh, obeying your word, being open to receive your word and allow it to transform our hearts. We know this is only possible by your Holy Spirit working and ministering to our hearts. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would do this work in us right now. Help us to eliminate the distractions. Lord, we are such a distracted people. Uh, we admit and we confess this. There's so many things going through our minds at times. Maybe it's physical tiredness. Maybe it's what we're going to do tomorrow, what we're going to eat for lunch. Whatever it may be, Lord, help us to focus in on your words and know that these words bring life, that these words are what we live on. And so we give you this time. We give you our attention. Have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so up, up to this point in the letter, uh, we see that Paul has been just thanking God for this church, right? We remember that this is a church that is under a the attack of false teaching in the church, but Paul is really thankful because this church is relatively healthy. They're still faithful. They're growing in their faith. They have love for one another, right, because of the hope that is laid up for them in heaven, right? And we see that Paul is praying for this church that God would fill them with more wisdom, more knowledge of his will so that they can walk fully pleasing to God. And then last week we saw, you know, Brother Andrew was preaching on how 
Paul is pretty much just telling the Colossian church how big Jesus is, right? How he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, right? How he's the head of the church. He's the one through whom and for whom all things were created. He's the one who holds the universe together, right? We sang that song, he holds the universe. This is who Jesus is. And he's the one who reconciled us reconciled all things through his cross. And so Paul is saying, Jesus, he's God. <laughs> this Jesus, he is God. He is supreme. And then now in our passage, we see that Paul, he kind of changes uh, gears a little bit and he starts talking about himself. Okay? He sort of almost introduces himself because remember, he has never been to this church. And he's writing to people that he's never met before. And so he's sort of introducing himself in this passage. Okay? And what he's saying, the first thing that he says, frankly, it sounds a little bit strange. Okay? It sounds almost a little bit heretical. Okay? Maybe, maybe some of you caught that when you read. You're like, what, what, what is he saying? Right? For in verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Okay? First of all, that, that, that alone is a little bit weird. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now, this is a very confusing passage, okay? And there, there's many, many interpretations of what this means, okay? And as I was studying this week, I read all these interpretations. But let me just tell you what this passage cannot mean, okay? What it absolutely cannot mean, what Paul is definitely not saying, Paul is not saying that something was lacking in Christ's sufferings in order to save us, in order to atone for our sins, in order to forgive us, that something was lacking. Paul is not saying that. He's not saying that the cross was suddenly, it's suddenly it's not enough. Okay? It's like the cross plus something else that you have to do. No, Paul is not saying that. And we know that because just a couple of verses ago, he said Christ reconciled us through the cross. He's done it. It's finished, right? That's what Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. It's done. The work for salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could be blameless before God, completely done. Nothing more that we need to do. Even the book of Hebrews says we're sanctified through Christ's sacrifice once and for all done okay so Paul is not saying something is lacking in Christ's suffering to save us he's not saying that I'm going to make that clear so then what is he saying what is Paul saying again many interpretations but I want to just give you one that I believe makes sense maybe even the most sense okay what Paul is saying is that what is lacking in Christ's afflictions is the fact that Christ is no longer physically here. Jesus is no longer here in the flesh. So he can't suffer here in the flesh. Why? Because he's in heaven right now. He is seated at the right hand of God. So he can't, what's lacking in the afflictions is the fact that he cannot suffer physically in the flesh anymore. Therefore, what Paul is saying is that the suffering that I'm going through, the suffering that Paul is enduring, it is on behalf of Christ. In other words, it is to show the sufferings of Christ. To show it. What is lacking in Christ's afflictions is the fact that it's not visible anymore. So Paul is saying, I am filling up what is lacking by showing you, showing to the world Christ's sufferings. Showing the world Christ. That's what he's saying. Paul's pain is that the world may gain Christ. That they may know him. And this was Paul's mission in life. He says it in verse 25. He says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. And then in verse 28, he says, Him we proclaim, Jesus, Him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. 
And so this was Paul's purpose in life, to make Christ fully known, right? To tell everyone about Christ and to labor, to work, to teach, to warn, to tell everyone so that they would grow mature in Christ. So it wasn't just about, you know, telling people about Jesus and seeing them saved and checking a box saying, okay, you're good. But no, he labored his whole life to see them grow up in Christ, which is why he's writing a letter to people he's never met before, because he wants to see them grow in Christ. But because he's doing this, because he's fulfilling his mission, he's suffering. And Paul, if you know, Apostle Paul, he suffered a lot. Right? He suffered a lot. I mean, he was beaten. Right? He's writing this letter from prison, literally from his jail cell, chained to a Roman soldier. He's writing this letter. Okay? He was whipped. And when I say whipped, I'm not talking about like take out my belt and whip. Right? It's the type of whip that literally would take flesh off of your skin every time it hits you. But he was whipped, beaten, mocked. He knew starvation, he was thirsty, he was hungry, he was sick, he was shipwrecked. I mean, he suffered a lot all so that others would gain. All so that they would know Christ. All so that they would grow mature in him. And how many, how many have gained because Paul suffered, right? How many have come to know Christ because he decided, my pain, your gain. Right? How many? You and I, we are all here today. We are all believers because somebody decided to say, my pain, your gain. Someone chose willingly to say, you know what? My pain, your gain. Starting with Jesus himself. Right? Jesus himself, he suffered. He was crucified on a cross. Why? So that we could have life so that we could have forgiveness of sin, so that we could have eternity with him. The apostle Paul and all the apostles, they suffered, all of them died. Why? To bring this good news to the ends of the earth. The early church, the missionaries suffered, devoting their entire lives, traveling thousands of miles to bring this gospel to every single corner of the earth. And right now, you and I, living here in Korea, are worshiping Jesus because somebody Somebody decided to save my pain for your gain. You know, I think about all the people in my life that suffered in some way or another. Maybe it wasn't so much the physical suffering like Paul, but they suffered in some way so that I would gain. And the first person that I think about is my dad, okay? my father. And you know, if you were to ask me or my brothers, I have two older brothers, something about my dad, we would all tell you the same thing. We would tell you my dad was a man of prayer. Okay. He wasn't a perfect dad. Okay, I'm not here to brag about him. He had a lot of flaws. But one thing that we know is that he prayed. And when I say prayer, it, it's like the Korean style, like screaming, like hallelujah, that kind of prayer. And it was early in the morning, every single morning. That's how I remember this because every single morning, like 5 a.m., he'd be screaming downstairs. And, and frankly, when I was a kid, it was kind of annoying. I was like, oh, please, stop, stop, stop. But what he was praying for was for our family. Not just our family, but that was one of the things he was praying. He was praying that I would know Jesus. He was praying that my brothers would know Jesus. And when I think about that, I'm like, you know what? He chose to suffer for me. You know, he could have been in bed like the rest of us. He could have been under his covers and in a nice dream or something. He could have been watching TV. He could have been eating breakfast or whatever he wanted to do. But no, he chose to be on his knees praying for us. Right? And so I think about him and I, and I think... My dad, he went through some pain, and I believe that I am who I am because he prayed for me, you know? That I have this relationship with God because my dad suffered for me. You know, I think about many people even in this ministry, especially those who are serving the ministry, you know, everyone who serves here, it's not like they're doing it for money. They don't get paid. We, we hardly recognize them sometimes, but, you know, they're, they're doing this. They're giving up their free time, right? They could be doing other things that are much more comfortable, but they're sacrificing, they're saying, my pain, so that we could, we could gain in our relationship with God, that we could grow up. And so I just want to honor those, especially, and commend those who are serving, who are saying, my pain, your gain. I want to thank you, because we are gaining because of you. But what about the rest of us? What about those of us who were like, my pain is my gain? My pain's not for your gain, it's, it's for my gain, that's it. I'm going through a hard enough time as it is. 
What about the rest of us? Have we ever been willing to say my pain for your gain? Are we willing? Are we, would we voluntarily say, you know what, yes, I will say my pain for your gain because ultimately Jesus said that to us. He said my pain is for your gain. And so my hope, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would move our hearts today to say yes, Lord. I will say my pain, your gain, because you said that to me. It's my hope and prayer. Now, I want to be clear, okay? I want to be clear that my point is not to say that we should seek suffering. We should seek pain, like everybody go out right now and just seek pain, right? Go out and go, go suffer for God. That's not the point of what I'm saying, okay? We were not made to suffer. It's not even part of our original design. No one likes to suffer, right? No one, does anyone here like to suffer? Like, you're like, yes, I want to go. Nobody does. It's because we were not created that way. I mean, think about Jesus even himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He prays three times to the Father to take this cup of suffering away. Take it away, Lord. If there's any other way, please. Like, we don't like to suffer, but Jesus suffered because he obeyed God. He obeyed the Father. And so you don't have to look for suffering because if you are a Christian, okay, if you are trying to live your life fully pleasing to God, if you are trying to obey him and follow him, there will be some suffering. I'm sorry to say this to you. There will be suffering, okay? The Bible is crystal clear on this fact that Christians will suffer. Jesus even says in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, in this world, you will have troubles. You will. Look at what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, and it'll come out on the screen. Peter says this. He says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Don't be surprised when you suffer. You know, some of us, we get kind of surprised when we suffer as Christians. We're like, what in the world? Why am I suffering? I'm, I'm trying to follow God. I'm trying to honor him. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. Why am I suffering? I shouldn't be suffering. My life should be good. God should be blessing me. I'm sorry to say <laughs> that's not true. That's what we call the prosperity gospel, honestly. You shouldn't be surprised if you are suffering as a Christian. It's not something strange if we're going through a hard time because we live in a broken world. We live in a world that hates God. The prince of this age is Satan, who hates and who is contrary, who is against God. And so when we try to follow God, you shouldn't be surprised that they're suffering. It's not easy. So you don't have to look for suffering. Okay, I hope that nobody leaves this place like, all right, I'm going to go look for suffering. You don't have to. Just, just obey God and it'll come. It'll happen. Okay? <laughs> You're like, I don't want to obey God now, right? I'm sorry to say. Okay? Instead, what we need to do is we need to embrace suffering when it comes. We need to embrace suffering what does that mean? What does that mean that we need to embrace suffering? It means to do what Paul does in this text, okay? It means to do what we just read from 1 Peter, what he told us. What do they say? Rejoice. Rejoice in suffering. Now, some of you are looking at me like, what? <laughs> like, that's crazy. <laughs> Who rejoices in suffering? I mean, are we, are, we, are we like masochists, right? We like hurt ourselves. Yes, yes, I'm rejoicing that I'm suffering. Like, is that, what, is that what Paul's saying? He's like, I'm so happy that I'm suffering. Literally? No, no. I don't, I don't think that's what Paul is saying. That would be crazy, okay? That would be probably not very honest as well. To rejoice in suffering is to say, God, this really hurts. God, this is really tough. I, I would, honestly, I would rather not go through this. 
but your will be done. I trust you, God. Right? It's like that song we sing. Whatever comes my way, I can trust you. I trust that you're doing something. Even if I don't know what it is, I trust you. I trust that you are good. I trust that you will work this for good. Maybe you're trying to teach me something in my character. Maybe you're trying to teach me to rely more upon you. Maybe you're using my suffering as a demonstration of your power in me. Maybe you're going to save someone through my testimony of suffering. I don't know, but I trust you, God. My pain for your gain. I trust you. You know, I think about, I think about the testimony of, of Dan Bauman. I know I brought him up before, but I mean, he's just so recent in my mind because we had him share here. Uh, Dan Bauman, who, was, who suffered in an Iranian prison cell, you know, who was mistreated. He was beaten by one of the prisoner guards. And rather than being angry, rather than living in hatred, rather than running away from the suffering, he embraced it, right? He, he befriends this Iranian guard. He, he wants to be his friend. He wants to tell him the love of Jesus, even though this guy just beat him up and is beating him up for days. He embraces his suffering. He rejoices in it. And because he did that, I mean, this guard, he's confounded, right? He's confused. Like, what in the world is going on? Because the world doesn't know what to do when, when people rejoice in suffering. Right? The world is like kind of confused. Like, what in the world is going on? Like, how are these people happy about their suffering? How are these people thankful for their suffering? Because it shows the power of Christ. When we rejoice in our suffering, it shows that there's something greater than our suffering. There's something way beyond what I'm going through. And it shows the world Christ. Aren't those the most powerful testimonies? You know, when, when people go through some serious stuff, right, when they go through some real suffering and, and, and they come out saying, God is good. I trust him. I can lean on him. I love him. I will not stop praising him. I mean, aren't those the most powerful demonstrations of the reality of God? It's because these people are choosing to say, my pain, your gain. I went through something so difficult, but you know what? If it's going to show you Christ, I'm willing to go through it. I'm willing to be thankful for it. I'm willing to embrace this if it's going to lead to you knowing the power of this God that lives inside of me. You know, I was talking recently to someone in our body, actually, someone that I know, and she was telling me about how, you know, this person suffered a loss in her family, and uh, she was telling me how she's thankful you know, she's actually thankful for this because not only did it bring her closer to God, but she's thankful because now she's thinking about all the people that she's going to be able to help that are going through the same thing, that suffer loss in their family. She's, she's thinking about, you know what, I will be able to help them. I'll be able to encourage them. I'll be able to point them to Jesus. And I just thought, man, that is, that's it right there. That's a, that's a, that's a life of my pain, your gain. My pain is going to be for your gain. So what is it that causes people to respond this way? What is it that causes people to, to be able to embrace and actually rejoice in their suffering, to be able to say, my pain is going to be for your gain? I mean, what, what is it? It's, it's this mystery. Okay, I'm not talking about a mystery like we, we, we can't figure it out. Okay, like what? what? It's a mystery. That doesn't, that doesn't help me. No, it's the mystery that Paul is talking about in this passage. In verse 26, he's talking about making the word of God fully known, right? This is his calling. And he says, what is it? It's, it's the mystery that's been hidden for the ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of of the glory of this mystery. And what is it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. The riches of the glory of this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I know maybe when you hear that, you're like, that's it? <laughs> 
that's the mystery? <laughs> like, I thought you were going to say something greater. I mean, that's the mystery. That's what makes people be able to rejoice in their suffering. That, that's it. And it's hard for us to, to understand because we, we have to understand how huge this is. Paul is, is talking about the Gentile inclusion in the promises of God. But for us, we're so far removed that sometimes we take it for granted. And so I want you to just track with me for a moment to the Old Testament. I'm going to just kind of bring you back real shortly just to give you a picture of how big this actually is, that Christ lives in every single one of us here, from every nation maybe represented here, that he lives in us. So back in Genesis, okay, the very beginning of the Bible, God made a promise to Abraham, okay, he made a promise to make him a great nation, that he's going to bless him and so that he would bless all the other nations and that every single nation, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through him. And so Israel, the nation that came from Abraham, they've always believed that the promises belong to them alone. They were the chosen people of God, not the Gentiles, not the non-Israelites, the non-Jews, only the Jews. It belonged to us. The Messiah, the promise of a future king to restore and make this nation of Israel so great, it belonged to Israel. Only Israel, not the Gentiles. Now, let me give you an illustration that, that, that I heard. Okay, I came across this illustration, and hopefully it will bring to light um, just how amazing this mystery is that we, I don't know if there's anybody here that's Jewish, of Jewish descent, but I'm not talking to you then, but we, the rest of us who are Gentiles, that we are included as the people of God, that we have the Holy Spirit in us, how amazing this is. And so let me give you this illustration. I want you to imagine that, that you... Okay, assuming that you are a Gentile, a non-Jew, okay, which is probably most of us, that you are living in the time of Israel. Okay, you're living there, and you are on top of a mountain, and on top of this mountain, you look down, and you see the tabernacle. Okay? You see the dwelling place of God. And so you look, and you think, wow, that's, that's really interesting. I wonder what that is. I'm going to go and check it out. And so you go down the mountain, and you walk straight up to the gate. Okay, there's only one way to get in there. But you walk straight up to the gate, and you find a guard there. And you ask the guard, you say, what, what is this place? And the guard tells you, this is the, this is the house of Yahweh. Th this is the house of the one who created the heavens and the earth. This is the God who created you. This is the God of all gods. This is where he dwells. And so you say, well, can I go in there? And he looks at you. The guard looks at you and says, you're, you're not from around here, are you? Because if, if you were an Israelite, I mean, you would know that, that this is for you. Where are you from? And so you would look at him and say, well, uh, I'm from Los Angeles. <laughs> you know, like, I know it's kind of far from here, but yeah, I'm not an Israelite. But I'm, I'm Korean. I mean, it's kind of closer to you guys. <laughs> and he would look at you and say, I'm sorry. This is not for you. No foreigner is allowed to go in here. Only an Israelite is allowed to go in here. And so you look at him and you say, well, was there anything that I could do to go in here? I mean, what, what do I have to do? I'd love to go in here. And the guard looks at you and says, if you want to go in here, I mean, you'd have to be born again. You literally have to be born again as an Israelite. Maybe of the tribe of Judah or maybe Benjamin, but you'd have to be born again. And so, you know, I'd just be discouraged and maybe I'd just keep looking and I'd say, well, what's that over there? What, what's that? And the guard would tell me, well, that, that's, that's the tabernacle. That, that's where the priests go in to offer incense to God. And behind a heavy veil is the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, that's where the very presence of God dwells. The glory of God, it dwells in there. And so I would say, man, I would love to go in there. I would love to, to see this God. I would love to experience this God. And the guard would look at me and say, you, you would not only have to be born again to go in there, but you would have to be born to the tribe of Levi. You'd have to be a priest, probably of the family of Aaron. You'd have to be born again into that family in order to go in there. I mean, even I can't go in there. If I try to go in there right now, I would die. I would get struck down. 
And so I would look at him and say, man, if only I had been born an Israelite of the tribe of Levi in the family of Aaron, then I could go into the holy holies. Then I could actually go in there and gaze upon God himself. I could actually be in his presence and worship him and be filled with his presence. I could do that. And the God would look at me and say, no, no. No way. No, no, no. You got it all wrong. Not even priests are allowed to do that. There's only one person who's allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, and that's the high priest. And he's only allowed to go in there once a year after all these elaborate preparations to make sure that, that he's clean, to make sure he's pure so that he doesn't get struck down. And he goes in there for a very short time to atone for the sins of Israel. You can't go in there. You can't go in there. You'll die. This God is extremely holy. I mean, sin cannot be found even near him or his wrath will consume us. And so after all this, after this conversation, we would just walk away completely hopeless without any hope that we could ever enter in to know this God. But this is the mystery this is the mystery that Jesus Christ, who we heard last week, the fullness of God dwells in him. The fullness, the holy of holies, that very presence in the person of Jesus Christ lives in every single believer. That is a mystery. Think about this. Think about your heart. Think about what's in there. I don't like to think about what's in my own heart. I get discouraged because there's some junk in here. There's some filth in here that you guys probably don't know. My wife knows better than you guys, but there's stuff in here, and that's where this holy God is living, purifying us by his blood, sanctifying us, renewing us every single day, moment by moment, into the image of who we were created to be until one day Jesus comes back and we'll be like him and we'll be with him forever and ever. Christ in us, the hope of glory. This is why we can rejoice in suffering. This is why we can embrace pain so that others might gain because we know that Christ lives in us and that means that there is hope. There is real, real hope for glory. Glory. Now, if this isn't true, if it's not true that Christ lives in us and that we have hope for glory, then there is absolutely no motivation. There's absolutely no power to be able to rejoice in your suffering because there's no answer for it. We can't possibly live saying, my pain for your gain, unless we know that there is something far greater than any pain that we could ever experience. Unless we know that Christ lives in us. And that's the good news. It's true. Christ lives in us, which means we have hope for glory. Romans 8, chapter 8, or Romans chapter 8, verses 18 says this. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I mean, can you just imagine this? I was trying to think about this. This is really hard to wrap your mind how, around that somehow the glory of God is going to be so amazing that all the sufferings that we've ever experienced, all the sufferings of this world, I mean, think about it. Think about all the suffering that's ever happened throughout history, all the wars, all the murder, all the stealing, all the broken relationships, all that, all the suffering, that somehow it's not even going to compare to God's glory. I mean, that is mind-blowing. I can't even begin to think how great God's presence is, how great that glory, that hope of glory is in us. I can't even imagine it. But the word of God is telling us it's going to be beyond what you can ever imagine. And it's going to make that suffering feel like nothing. Nothing. 
And if we really believe that, if we really take hold of that, then we, like Paul, can say in verse 29, I'm going to end with this, we can say this, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is what Paul is laboring for. This is what he's striving for. With all the power of the Holy Spirit that it lives in him, he's doing whatever he can to make the word of God known, to see believers mature in Christ because he wants everyone to know the hope of glory. Because if they don't know the hope of glory, I mean, there are so many people in this world that are suffering without any hope of glory, and if they don't know the hope of glory, if they don't have Christ in them, then their pain is only going to become an endless pain. It's going to be even worse than what we experience here because it's going to be a life completely separated from God, completely devoid of any presence of God. And so Paul says, I'm laboring because I know that I have the hope of glory. I know that I have the solution. So I'm laboring. I'm striving. I'm doing whatever it takes. My pain is for your gain because I want you to gain Christ. And that is my hope for this body for us as believers, brothers and sisters, that this is what we toil and struggle for, to make Christ known through whatever pain or suffering we may experience, that others may gain Christ, that others may share in the hope of glory. Let's pray together. Just take a couple moments before the Lord and, and just respond. I believe the Holy Spirit uh, is speaking to many of us, maybe in different areas of our lives. And, and so I just want you to be able to listen and to respond to his promptings. Just uh, maybe we can take a moment to think about um, those in our lives, those that we have relationships with in our workplaces or in our families, or some of our friends, maybe even some of our closest friends that don't have the hope of glory. And maybe we can, um, if you're willing, if you're moved, if, if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, maybe we can even just make a commitment to say, Lord, I'm willing, whatever it takes, whether that means just praying for them like consistently, getting on my knees every single day, making that um, something, a pain that I go through. Maybe it's even just fasting on their behalf, whatever it may be, to respond and say, Lord, I, I want my pain to be for their gain. I want them to know Jesus. I want them to know the hope of glory. I want them to know Christ in me. Can we take a moment and just labor on their behalf at this moment?
Father, we, uh, we just confess before you, Lord, that uh, it's oftentimes so difficult to live for the gain of others. In fact, again, Lord, we, we are such um, selfish people. Lord, we, we are, it's so easy to just think about ourselves, think about what we're going through. But Father, I pray that um, just as you have commanded us in your word to, to love others, to consider others better than ourselves, to live so that others might gain Christ. Father, help us by the power of your spirit in us. We cannot do it on our own strength. There's no way. But Holy Spirit, because you live in us, because you strengthen us with all power, we know that it is possible every time we remember our Lord Jesus and how he suffered on our behalf, how he went through so much so that we could gain. Lord, let us now do the same. That whatever may come our way, Lord, we will trust you. We will trust that you're working it for your good. We will trust that you're using it to expand your kingdom. We will trust that you're going to use it to bless others around us that might go through the same thing. Whatever it is, we trust you. We embrace it and we say, Lord, our pain, let it be for the gain of others that they may know you. So we give you our lives, Lord. We give you our uh, worship because you're worthy of it. We thank you for your word. May it, may it not go back empty. Lord, may it produce fruit in our lives and may um, so many be blessed because of it. So many sons and daughters come to glory because of it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.